In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We continue talking about Elijah the prophet, his ministry, his prophecies, his works. And so we're taking a journey through the book of First Kings. We're in chapters 20 and 21. Most people don't study these chapters, but I will argue that these are some of the most important chapters in the book of First Kings because it shows us how merciful God is. And in a very special way, it helps us to understand the ministry of Elijah and also the ministry of John the Baptist. So if you really wanna understand the connection between Elijah and John the Baptist, I think that these chapters are very essential to understand that connection, um, especially theologically. So what's happening here? Well, God is going to show how merciful he is. He's going to forgive the worst of kings numerous times in this section. And so over and over again, he's forgiving this evil king who has a very weak moral character who allows his wife, Jezebel, to kill prophets and kill righteous men. God works miracles for this king. His name is Ahab. And Ahab just doesn't seem to figure it out. He, he's the type of person who is just simply doing his own will. No matter what God does for him, he just kind of does whatever he wants. And so he typifies the person who has very weak moral character, doesn't recognize the work of God, the presence of God, the love of God, the mercy of God, and simply follows his heart, you could say. And so the Lord protects Ahab on two separate occasions from a Syrian king. Now, the, Syri the Syrian kingdom was north of Israel. You shouldn't confuse it with the empire called the Assyrian Empire. So, you know, it's kind of a little, uh, you know, confusing at, at some times, you know. But the Syrian kingdom, the king there, his name was Ben-Hadad. And so he Ben Hadad goes to Ahab in the very beginning of chapter 20 and he threatens Ahab saying give me your possessions your wives your children and Ahab is ready to just kind of hand it over. So let's just read a little bit from chapter uh, 20. So if you go to, if you go to chapter 20 it says Ben Hadad the king of Syria gathered all his army together 32 kings were with him and horses and chariots and he went up and besieged Samaria. Samaria was the capital of northern Israel. That was the place where Baal worship was centralized. There was an altar built to, to Baal, this false god, in the capital of north, the northern kingdom. It tells you where their priorities are, not with the Lord. And he fought against it. So he's fighting against the city of Samaria. And he sent messengers into the city to Ahab, king of Israel, and said, Thus says Ben-Hadad, your silver and your gold are mine. Your fairest wives and children are mine. And the king of Israel answered, As you say, my lord, O king, I am yours and all that I have. So Ahab's just like ready to hand it all over. He's ready to give his children away. He's ready to give his wives away. You know, He's ready to give everything away to this king. He doesn't have any moral character. He won't even protect his family. He won't even negotiate, right? And then he's going to try to negotiate a little later on. And so let's see what happens here. So the Lord's going to do some amazing things to protect this absolutely disobedient king. Okay. So let's go, let's go back to uh, our notes on this. Okay. And let's continue walking through. So here's what happens. So first, Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, Syria, threatens King Ahab, and, and his demands are completely unreasonable. And Ahab, being a man of very little moral character, he doesn't stand up for anything. And that, that's what happens when you don't have a strong moral character. You fall like that. But if you have strong moral character, you're going to stand up against things that are wrong. So initially... Ahab even seems to give, you know, his consent, go ahead and take it, you know, as long as I'm okay. And so an unnamed prophet approaches Ahab. Notice how God is warning him. So an unnamed prophet comes up to him and tells him, the Lord through this unnamed prophet tells Ahab that he will deliver the multitude of Ben-Hadad's army into his hand. Imagine this, I'm gonna turn the tables just like that. This king is, is threatening the life of every person in the city, and the unnamed prophet says, 
God is going to deliver him into your hand, this very evil king. So you can punish him and you can stop this threat. So hence, in an act of faith, Ahab will only leave, lead a very small army against him. So it's really amazing. So at one point, Ahab even says a proverb. So it, for a moment, Ahab suddenly starts to become this faithful king. And the king of Syria is threatening him. And Ahab says something of a proverb in verse 11. He says, do not let he who puts on his armor boast as he who takes off his armor. In other words, wait until the battle is done. Wait until it's all been done because God is going to decide this battle. That's kind of this, the, the meaning of the proverb. So um, he forms his army and he has 7,000 soldiers. And this may look all the way back to 1 Kings chapter 19 when God told Elijah that he has kept 7,000 from worshiping Baal. And so the 7,000 soldiers, they represent a faithful remnant. And as I said, the concept already came up in 1 Kings 19 when Elijah was saying, I'm the only one left. And the Lord says, no, Elijah, I have kept 7,000 from bending their knee and worshiping Baal. And so there, there's a sense of this is a holy remnant right here. And the concept of a holy remnant, it goes into battle. You can find this concept a few times in the Hebrew scriptures. You can look back to Abraham when he had only 318 men and he conquered a multitude of kings that's in Genesis chapter 14. And after that, he met Melchizedek. And then you can go to Judges and you can go to Judges chapter 7, when Gideon, with only a very small army of 300 men, was able to defeat an incredibly vast army. And so there, there's, a, there's a sense here that this is a holy remnant here. So Ahab goes and he attacks Ben-Hadad at noon while Ben-Hadad was drinking and he was drunk. So the sense is like Ben-Hadad thinks, <laughs> these guys don't have a chance. You know, and he's he's already celebrating. He's he's out there, I guess you could say, having a party. And so what happens is, is they actually beat the Syrians, who are also called the Arameans, okay? And he beats, they beat this army, this massive army, and they even pursue the army. Of course, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, it talks about if you are faithful to the Lord, you will pursue your enemies. And so Ahab's small army defeated the Syrians, Ben Hadad then would reason. He's going to reason. They won because their God was the God of the mountains. So Samaria had a lot of mountains. Okay. And so Ben Hadad is going to make a false conclusion about the God of Israel. You know, if we go out and fight him in the plain, then we'll beat him. Okay. So let's go back. They have a God who's a God of the mountains. And so Ultimately, the Lord is going to get involved here and he's going to say, no, 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 Ben-Hadad, don't say false things about the God of Israel. Okay, so here's what happens. Attempt number two, Ben-Hadad is going to arrange everything uh, so that they can fight on a plane. And this was really the strategy with ancient warfare is that you, you really wanted to meet your enemy in an area where you would have an advantage, whether it would be a mountains, hills, or plains. And so if you read any ancient his historical stories, you'll often see that the armies maneuvered so that the battlefield and the arrangement of the battlefield would be favorable to you know one of the armies. And so he's basically saying, okay, we're gonna try to work this out so we meet them in a plane and then we're gonna defeat them. Okay, so then another man of God comes to Ahab. Notice that it's not Elijah, but it's an unnamed prophet. Okay, and he's gonna he's going to recount that the king of Syria, Ben Hadad, has said erroneous things about the God of Israel. So the second victory over Ben Hadad is very theological. It reminds us a lot of the Exodus when God triumphed over Pharaoh. And so if you go back and study the Exodus, you can see that many of the plagues are showing that the gods of Egypt are in fact powerless. And then Pharaoh even likened himself to a god. And the final culminating victory shows that Pharaoh himself is not a god. And that 
who is like you, Lord? And that's what is said in the Song of Moses. If you go to Exodus 15, 11, who is like you? You're different than all these so-called gods. And you go to chapter 32 in the book of Deuteronomy, it says that these so-called gods are actually demons. And so, so we see the phrase, the phrase, and you shall know that I am the Lord, is a very special phrase here, and it's in 1 Kings 20, 28. You shall know that I am the Lord, because this is exactly what the Lord said about the Pharaoh before the waters of the Red Sea collapsed upon him in Exodus 14. You're going to know that the Lord is God when the judgment of God comes upon you because you have made yourself an adversary to the true God. So what happens? There's a seven day preparation before the battle. And so what does this remind you of? It reminds you of the battle of Jericho. If you go to Joshua chapter six, this is not a, an accident here. We can see how the narrator in first Kings is recalling many other scriptures in the Old Testament to show you that it is the same God who brought Israel out of Egypt the same God who brought them into the promised land. He is protecting his people. So what happens? The victory occurs on the seventh day, just as it did during the battle of Jericho. And there's a great victory. They slaughter a hundred thousand Syrian soldiers in one day. It's a complete decimation of the Syrian army. And so only with a small army, Ahab triumphs. It reminds you of Gideon's victory over the Midianites in Judges chapter 7. And so what does Ahab do? God wanted to put this enemy into Ahab's hands so that he would meet divine justice. And so this was a murderous king. And Ahab was supposed to judge him accordingly because God had given him this victory. So Ahab, being a man of very weak moral character, he actually makes a covenant with Ben-Hadad. It's kind of like it's not a good covenant because what's going to happen is the kingdom of Syria would not have persecuted the kingdom of Israel. Instead, because of this covenant, they will continue to persecute the kingdom of Israel. You're going to make a covenant with a king who cannot be trusted. And so you're basically making a deal with a very evil man. So Ahab, being a man of very weak moral character, enters into a covenant. This is actually something that was forbidden. You're not supposed to enter into covenants with other nations. You have a covenant with Yahweh. And so by making a covenant with Ben-Hadad, he's actually ignoring the great covenant that Israel has with Yahweh. He's, he's trying to do things politically rather than live the faith. And this is what sometimes people do is they put they put so much attention into political solutions that they forget about the faith. They leave the faith behind and their politics is kind of exalted over their faith. And of course we want to we want to advocate things in politics that support the faith, but our faith has to be first, not politics. So unfortunately Ahab put his politics first. And he goes and makes a covenant with this evil king. He doesn't execute God's divine judgment upon him. And this is going to turn out to be a huge problem to the people of Israel. Sometimes you, you could read it. If you don't know the background, you might think, you know, what a beautiful story. Esau and Jacob made peace. And then Joseph and his brothers made peace. But this is different here because this is a man who is distinctly evil and murderous. And so God put him into his hand. So what happens? After that, there's kind of a prophetic sign. It's kind of an interesting story where one prophet says to another prophet, strike me, and the prophet refuses, and he's killed by a lion. Then he goes up to another prophet and says, strike me, and the prophet strikes him, and he goes by the road, and he sees Ahab coming. It's, it's a prophetic sign. And so the, the prophetic sign shows that the word spoken to Elijah in 1 Kings 19, 15 to 17, where God told Elijah that the king of Syria would be replaced was not fulfilled by Ahab. So he didn't fulfill the word of the Lord. He didn't do what God wanted. And so the prophet is struck by another prophet. And it, it, it kind of symbolizes, look at how God struck your enemy 
and you were supposed to administer God's divine judgment upon this enemy so that he would no longer be a threat to Israel. So, but you didn't do it. This king was under the quote unquote ban and you did nothing. So it, it underlines how sometimes if you don't do anything, you can sin gravely. We call that a sin of omission a sin of omission. But this is even more than a sin of om omission because he's ignoring the word of God. He's doing whatever he wants, what, what he thinks is right in his, in his own eyes. And he's making a covenant with another nation, which is forbidden. So Ahab did a lot of things that were wrong here. He disobeyed the word of God. God worked miracles for him. He didn't recognize what those miracles were. He allowed a dangerous enemy to continue to be a threat to Israel. Um, he made a covenant which was specifically forbidden. And so the final message was that Ahab would lose his life. And of course, Ahab is very upset about this, but it even gets worse. Did he repent? No, he did not repent. And so Ahab continues his career of uh, allowing sinful things to happen. So here's what happens. In the next chapter, we have the story of a man named Nabot who has a vineyard. Nabot has this incredible vineyard, and it's near the house of Ahab. And Ahab says, you know what? I want this vineyard. I want to um, turn this into a garden, and I'll give you some great land and all kinds of other things. Nabot is a very religious man, and he says, no, 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 no. I can't give you this. This is my this is my ancestral inheritance. It's the inheritance that comes from God. It's been passed through my family, and therefore we can't give this away. And so Nabot refuses. So Ahab is very upset, but once again, to show you his weak moral character, his wife Jezebel says, let me handle this. And so Jezebel goes out and she basically writes letters in the name of Ahab, puts his seal on the letters, he, she orders the elders to accuse Nabot of false crimes and put him to death. So he's going to be accused of, of saying blasphemy against God and against the king. And so he's going to be put to death. And then Ahab will take the vineyard away. So what's happening here? Is Ahab doing something wrong? Well, what he's doing is because he's a king of such weak moral character, he's allowing his evil wife to do all these things in his name. He should have stood up and said, no, you can't do that. I'm the king. But instead, he has such weak character, he allows this to happen. You see a very similar um, situation in the New Testament where Herod um, he promises to give half the kingdom away, and his wife Herodias uh, encourages her daughter Salome to ask for the head of John the Baptist. So the New Testament shows Herod and Herodias in kind of a similar light. You know, Herod is an evil man, he's a murderous man, and he can't even stand up against his wife when she asks for something. And so Ahab's kind of the same way. His, his moral character is so weak he gives in to sin. And this is what happens to people who have very weak moral character. They give in to drugs. They, they give Their friends tell them to do something, and they do it because they don't stand for anything. So, you know the old saying, if you don't stand for something, you're going to basically fall into just about anything. And so you have to stand for something. Of course, we stand for Christ. We stand for the faith. And if you stand for the faith, you're going to be persecuted by your friends. You're going to have to tell them no. And so Nabot was a righteous man who said no. And so what happens in this story? So ultimately, the vineyard is taken away from Nabot. He's falsely accused and he's put to death. Okay, so, so the vineyard is taken away. Ahab gets possession of the vineyard. Jezebel, you know, she wrote letters and, and arranged the whole thing. He, Ahab allows this evil king to just run wild in his kingdom. She's practically ruling, you know, you know the, the kingdom because he's allowing her. She's killing the false, she, I mean, she's, she's killing the true prophets and she's supporting the false prophets. And he's just sitting there going along with everything. So you can see what happens when a person doesn't have a strong moral character. They cannot stand up to sinful things. And that's, and, and so you're probably asking, what about Elijah? Well, guess what? After Nabot is killed, after Ahab takes possession of the land, 
Elijah comes to meet Ahab. And the situation is really uh, amazing because Elijah finally comes. Notice that it was other prophets earlier. And that's why you have to read 20 and 21 together. Elijah meets Ahab while he's standing in the vineyard of Naboth. And he tells him, just as wild dogs ate this righteous man, Naboth, and he was killed in his own vineyard, where you stand, he says, well, guess what? Your wife and you will be eaten by wild dogs. Those who are part of Ahab's house will be eaten by wild dogs. The same sentence that was given to Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, who introduced idolatry into Israel, building two altars to golden calves. Well, that's going to be the same sentence that happens to you. Your line is going to be wiped out. All your descendants are going to be wiped out, and you and your wife are going to be eaten by wild dogs. So it's really a situation of, of divine retribution that just as you, you killed this righteous man and he was eaten by wild animals, so you and your wife will be eaten by wild animals. And so essentially um, Elijah explains that Ahab has sold himself to evil. The concept of selling yourself to evil, it reminds us of the slavery of the Egyptians when they were in slavery. But it, it looks at it from a moral perspective. He's selling himself to evil by worshiping false gods and allowing his wicked wife to make all these decisions in his kingdom in his name. So here's the key for, to understand these chapters. What's amazing, if you really want to understand the ministry of John the Baptist, and you want to understand these two chapters, which are so tough to understand, chapters 20 and 21, Ahab actually repents. He humbles himself, puts on sackcloth, he He's fasting. He's doing everything to repent. And this is the most amazing part of chapter 21. The word of the Lord comes to Elijah. God actually relents from punishing Ahab. And I think that the reader has to stop and look at how merciful God is. This is a evil king. God did miracles. He didn't recognize it. God worked in his life to help him and save him numerous times. He didn't care. He acted against the word of God. He, he did what was right in his own eyes. He let an evil king make decisions in his name. And even after all of this, God forgives Ahab. That's absolutely amazing. So a lot of times when people say, you know, the Old Testament is, you know, God is so cruel. I always tell them, you need to read the Old Testament more closely. You're going to see in the Old Testament or Hebrew scriptures that God is so merciful and so patient. And so how long is this repentance going to last? Well, this is what you call foxhole repentance. Foxhole repentance is when you get caught, you repent, and then you go back to doing um, what you were doing before. It's kind of like the you know Bugs Bunny getting trapped by Elmer Fudge, and he puts down his ears for one moment and he repents, but then after that, he's back to his old tricks. Well, Ahab is going to repent for a little bit, and then he's going to be back to his old tricks. But what the, what the narrator is showing you here is look at how merciful God is. When he finally meets Elijah, judgment is proclaimed upon him, his family, his household, and God says, I will forgive you if you repent. And so this is going to help us to understand the ministry of John the Baptist because John comes preaching a baptism of repentance. And when you look closely at what John the Baptist says, he talks about bearing fruits that befit your repentance. So if you go back and read like Matthew uh, chapter 3, and um, I'm going to just go uh, read a little section from Matthew chapter 3. John the Baptist talks about uh, sincere repentance. So I'm just going to pick up here and read Matthew chapter 3. And if you, if you look at Matthew chapter 3, verse 9, he says, Matthew 3, verse 9, do not pursue, presume, do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. The trees could represent people here. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So he's saying, you know, you need to bear fruit, which are the works of faith that you do. You need to bear works of faith that demonstrate that you are truly 
repentant. That's John the Baptist. So you can see how what John the Baptist is saying here really helps us to understand this situation here. God forgave Ahab. Ahab was an absolutely evil king. He was more evil than any king before him, and God still gave him the opportunity to repent. And this really tells you something of, about how um, our Lord wants to be merciful. A lot, um, in the book of Ezekiel, it says that God does not desire the death of the sinner, but that the sinner would repent and live. And you see this throughout the Hebrew scriptures. So unfortunately, Ahab's repentance was not a sincere repentance. He did not continue to bear the fruits of his repentance. And so we're going to pick up and we're going to continue through our story. And we're going to talk about how things turned out for Ahab and Jezebel. But I just want you to see the connection between how merciful God is to this king who is so rebellious. And so we can look at our own lives with confidence. We can approach the throne of grace to ask the Lord for mercy and to authentically turn away from sin, to bear real genuine fruits of repentance and to live the faith sincerely in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.